Selamat pagi. Nadia, ciao an. This topic cultivating a positive organization culture in remote working environments has attracted more attention than we thought. Earlier we thought we will have 100 plus attendees but we have over 300 to register. And the reason that we play a few rounds of the video is to allow those who are registered to get in. Let's look at the housekeeping. All participants will be on the listening mode. Please submit your questions on the Q&A icon. In between the presentation by the speaker, we will pause for a couple of questions before proceeding uh, into the, the second part. Use the chat icon for general comment or for any help. Click to upvote the questions for priority attention so that I know which question or questions have more uh, requests. The speaker strikes, as previously, will be emailed to all who attended the webinar after the webinar. Now I'd like to introduce the speaker. The speaker is Shoham Adizis. Now, Shoham is no stranger to Asia. Since 2000, he has traveled from LA to Indonesia almost every month. They have a, uh, a major client in Indonesia. He also worked in Thailand for a few years because we also have a licensee in Bangkok. Every year, if I next slide, every year the RDC's principals and partners, or you can say licensees, meet every year in different countries usually in a country where there is a, a licensee. And uh, the last was in Bangkok, January, Bangkok, 2020. She, we missed that, right? After that, March 18, 2020, we were locked down for nearly about well, 18 months now. If you look at the gentleman here, we have two chairs from the right of uh, Kia Kok Soon, also, um, he certified our thesis for many years. Um, he attended that. Beside me, there's another one from Europe, I mean, your principal. And in the next one is the handsome uh, Shoham, who will be the speak, speaking today. And next one is the Thai partner. Some of you might have met him, Rangsam, and Bo, who is a chair now for two groups. And next. Adizis and me, or if you like Nilex, or even Vistage for that matter, that relationship, if you like the marriage, has been for nearly 38 years. And I think I met him when I was still a young punk, right? Looks still young and didn't change much now. Well, I would say I can vouch that the impact of the Adizis methodology has been profound and even surprise some of the, uh, our, um, our major shareholders and, uh, and headquarters. We won the 2001 or certified now 2001 in Malaysia, first, first one in Malaysia. I was uh, privileged to be voted boss of the year. Then the same year, Nilex was voted if fifth of the 10 top best managed company by Asia Money. And we won the TKM award in 1992, uh, sorry. Now, when we won the award, we were asked, me and the direct reports, to share what make us won the award or what, what did we do? So in fact, all our key managers have to go around even to 
the other parts of the country to share. And we did share the methodology of a collective leadership. Now with that intro, I would then ask you to put our hands together to welcome our speaker, Shoham Adisis. By the way, he's presenting from Indonesia. Welcome. Thank Shoham. you, Richard. Thank you very much for that introduction. And thank you also to all the staff over at Vistage and obviously to all of you for giving me this opportunity to present to you. Uh, let me just share my screen and we'll get started. Okay, so what I'll be talking about today is first of all, the importance of culture and its relationship to sustaining high performance. Once we cover that, we'll talk about what kind of culture do we need for success? Let's define what is that culture. And then we can look at the role of the workplace in establishing your culture. And then we'll look at the other factors that determine culture, because there's more to it than just the work workspace. And to summarize my entire talk today is that a lot of emphasis is being placed on the workspace. And there's a lot of money being spent on making sure we have the best offices but there are other factors that determine culture beyond the workspace. And I'd like to take this opportunity, this opportunity of COVID, of people working remotely, to really give us a chance to explore what are those other factors that determine culture? And then how can we leverage them within a remote working environment to make sure that we're cultivating the right culture, even without that physical space to work in? So let's get started. Let's talk about the importance of culture and its relationship to sustaining high performance. And this kind of talk starts with Switzerland and Yugoslavia. And why is Switzerland an economic powerhouse? While well, Yugoslavia is a defunct state, it's actually no longer existent anymore. And even Serbia, which is the remains of Yugoslavia, is not an economic powerhouse by any means. What's the difference between these two countries? Now, Yugoslavia has lots of natural resources, lots of good land, lots of rivers, lots of coastline, lots of coal. They had a lot of assets going for them, while Switzerland has very little. It has no coastline. It has mountains and snow. And what does it have going for it? But yet, um, Switzerland is... Yes? I cut up just an echo uh, from you. Okay, let me, I'm going to, is that better? Yep. I'll keep on talking here and see if that's better. Yep. Sorry, I had a, a backup here. <laughs> so, so Switzerland only has mountains and snow. So how is it that Switzerland is an economic powerhouse? Now, some people say that Yugoslavia has Orthodox Christians, Catholics, and Muslims all living together. Of course, they're going to be at war. Of course, it's going to get destroyed. But wait a second, Switzerland has Italians, Germans, and French also living together. They've also been at war for hundreds of years. So then what makes Switzerland an economic powerhouse while Yugoslavia is a defunct state? And Serbia is nowhere on the list of economic powerhouses. What about Japan, a small island in the Pacific with very little natural resources versus Angola, which is a giant country with gold, diamonds, oil, everything you'd want, good land. Where is Angola on the list of economic powerhouses versus Japan? What's the message here? The message is quite simple. It's not what you have. It's not your assets that determine your success. It's your culture. And this is true for countries. It's true for companies. It's true for families. And it's even true for individuals. Now, a long time ago, 20 years ago, I probably would go into a long explanation of why this is true. But I think that more recently, there's been many books written about the power of culture. It's almost accepted nowadays as, as you know, something that determines success. So I think I can move forward and kind of take this for granted that there is some alignment about the power of culture. What I'd like to discuss now is what kind of culture do we need? What kind of culture do we want? What is the culture of success? And I don't think we need to look too much further than the, you know, the motto of different countries. 
you might recognize this one. Here are some other ones from different countries. I think these kind of all have one thing in common and, and they are sort of describing the desired culture that is needed for success. And I won't go into which countries which, but I'll just say that in Adesis, we try and summarize what makes a culture of success is really age old. It's nothing new. It goes back to the Bible. And I'm not talking about the Jewish Bible or the Muslim Quran or even the Bahá'u'lláh Gita or the New Testament. It's in every one of them. There's something in common there. And we summarize it with the saying of mutual trust and respect. That is the culture of success. Why is that the culture of success? And it's, it's included in all these other ones here. And I'll explain to you why this determines success. Because for a successful organization or country or family to operate, we need different people with different strengths that complement each other. There's even a Chinese saying, which is, if two people think the same, one is unnecessary. We need different people who think differently with different strengths. But if we don't respect each other, we think that we are always right and everybody else is stupid, we're not going to learn from each other. We're not going to feed off of each other's strengths to get better decisions. And if we don't trust each other, well, not only are we different in our strengths, not only are we different in our opinions, we're also different in that we have different self-interest. Definition, different people have different self-interest. And if there's no trust in the long term, common, win-win, then everybody in the short term will start focusing on their own win and we'll all be fighting internally over our, our own interests rather than the common interest of the organization. So in order for a company to succeed, a company with different people, with different strengths, with different self-interest, which is natural, what we need is a culture of mutual trust and respect. We'll go a little bit further and then we'll save time for questions in the middle of our, our session. Just take a look at Switzerland. It has a culture of mutual trust and respect. You have people who live in a German speaking part and people who live in a French speaking part. When they go across the borders, they change languages. They accept the fact other people within their same country speak a different language. Japan, tremendous culture of mutual trust and respect. Yugoslavia, not much. Angola, not so much. And I won't go into their histories, but it's presented in the countries we talked about. So now that we know we need a culture of mutual trust and respect, let's take a look at the role of the workplace in establishing culture. And there are many articles about this, about the work, why the workplace is critical to employee success or how office space shapes company culture. Now, I don't know how much faith you put in these articles. They probably or likely were written by organizations trying to sell office spaces. But without a doubt, companies are spending a lot of money on making sure they have the right office space like this, you might recognize as the Apple spaceship. They spent billions of dollars building this campus in California to get the right culture, presumably to get success. Yet, obviously right now, it's sitting empty. How would this, working in this environment, affect your culture? As opposed to perhaps this environment. How would that affect your culture? about this, this is from an article in Applied Workplace, talking about the best and worst office designs. So a lot of emphasis is put on making sure we have good office designs to promote the right culture. This was another best in class office space. This is an office built in a bunker in Sweden. How would you like to have meetings in that meeting room hanging from the ceiling in a cave? How would that affect your culture? Here were some examples of bad office spaces. They said that the uniformity of the different desks would hinder unique individual thought. That's what they were arguing. And this one said it had no privacy. 
and I don't know how you feel about these different office spaces, I would just point out that some of the biggest, fastest growing companies started in this office space, in a garage. Obviously today, people are working remotely. So this whole idea of how important the office space in determining your culture is kind of null and void for the time being. So now we have to look at what else affects company culture. What are the other factors? And that's what we're gonna go into now. And then we'll take questions. And then we'll look into how to apply it in an online working environment. So what we want is a culture of mutual trust and respect. And to explain the factors, the four factors that go into creating this culture, I will use the analogy of an apple pie. When you're cooking an apple pie, because creating a culture is analogous to cooking an apple pie, the first thing you need is good ingredients. In your organization, your ingredients are your people. And if you have bad apples, they will ruin your apple pie. Same thing in your organization. A bad apple, a bad person, is someone who can't be trusted, can't be respected, and doesn't respect others. They think they're always right, and they're always looking for opportunities to stab other people in the back. Obviously, if you have bad apples in your organization, well, people say fire them. I say, wait a second. Before you fire them, recommend them to your competition. Let them suffer. Well, that's kind of a joke because most of the time or oftentimes these people who aren't very good team players, sometimes they can be the most important salesman or a critical IT person. You know, typical IT is good with computers, bad with people. So what do you do if this person is critical within your organization? And the answer is, is we have to sort of quarantine them, not in the COVID sense, but more in a sense of don't let them contaminate your organization's culture. You treat them like a subcontractor. You kind of keep them separate. Um, you definitely do not promote them and you don't give them managerial responsibilities. That's step number one. Is, is everything okay with my sound, Richard? Are you guys hearing yes. me okay? Yes, okay. just down with that a bit. Yeah, okay. So we wanna make sure we have good people. Now, obviously, we don't hire bad apples. Your HR department doesn't have a job description looking for bad people. We have all kinds of tools to make sure we don't get bad apples. And yet many organizations end up with bad apples. Why? It's because people are a product of their environment. They're a product of the system. And what we often do is focus on the people and not the system, not the environment. You can touch the people. You can feel the people. You can't feel these other factors. But if they're not working well, they'll end up creating bad apples, even if you don't hire them. So what are these other factors? Again, people are a product of their environment, of the system. And it's easier to change the system and watch the people change than try and change the people and expect them to change their environment. So what are these other factors? Well, we could have good ingredients, but our recipe is broken. The recipe determines how we take the different ingredients and put them together. In your organization, the recipe is your managerial process. Your managerial process is the process used to identify problems and opportunities that come from change, make decisions about those problems or opportunities, what we're gonna do, communicate those decisions, follow up on those decisions to make sure they're being implemented, and then collect information to see what's happening so we can identify the new problems and then make next decisions. That's the managerial process. It's the process used to identify and address the problems and opportunities that come from change. In some organizations, if you say the problem, it means you cause the problem. So you better shh, sweep the problem under the rug, just let it sit there and sort of forget the problem, 
what happens when you do that? Does the problem go away? No. A problem unaddressed is a crisis in waiting. When that problem becomes a crisis, everybody starts pointing fingers at each other saying, you caused the problem. No, you caused the problem. And that obviously is bad for a culture of mutual trust and respect. Other organizations, they get together and they talk about their problems. But it's very heated argument and everybody's, you know, pointing fingers at each other and screaming and getting very emotional. Is that good for mutual trust and respect? No. People leave the meeting very much drained, mad at each other. And other organizations, they have very respectful meetings and people use words like my respected colleague and I you know, respectfully want to disagree. And they dance around the conflict like an elephant in the room. And at the end of the meeting, everybody's very nice to each other. They all go out for drinks and they're all good friends. But privately, what in this company, nothing's ever gonna change. They've lost respect and trust for themselves, for their own organization. So a good management process is one that is able to take the conflict inherent in change, inherent in solving problems and make it constructive. There are seven different sources of conflict and you know that's part of the business methodology. How do you make those conflicts constructive? How do you convert them? What are the strategies to make them constructive? One more thing about the management process that's critical is I'm going to mix analogies here, so I apologize. We're in the middle of an apple pie analogy. I'm going to jump to another analogy. This analogy is called holding the line. It's a military analogy. Maybe you've seen it in military movies. It's very important when the military attacks the enemy that they hold the line. If somebody jumps ahead, when we open fire, we'll shoot them. Or if somebody falls behind, when they open fire, they'll shoot us. The same thing happens in the decision-making process. There is a terrain we must cover together. And different people advance at different speeds. And they end up shooting each other. So understanding what that terrain is and how to hold the line, that's another one of the added values or part of the adhesis methodology. So what, what happens here is... A management process, some of you might have a management process known as an open door policy. If you have a problem, come knock on my door. I'm the CEO. Tell me your problem. We'll talk about it. We'll find a solution. And that is fine for a small 5, 10, 15 person, 20 person organization. But as the organization evolves and becomes more complex with 100 people, suddenly that management process no longer fits the complexity of the organization because people don't know you. They're not going to come knock on your door. There's too many people. We need a more robust, more evolved management system. What Adesis has is a highly evolved management process for multinational, highly complex organizations that we can adjust to meet the complexity, to match the complexity of the organization. So that's a take-home value. You have to Make sure your management process is matched to the complexity of your organization. Okay, let's move on. We're talking about an apple pie as, as an analogy for creating the culture of your organization. We said you need ingredients, good ingredients, good apples. We said you need a good recipe. Let's say we have both of them and we make our apple pie and we put it in the oven, but the oven is broken and it's set to whatever temperature we need but it's actually way too hot. What will have our apple? It will get burnt. In your organization, your oven is your structure. Just to give you a quick example of what I mean by getting burnt, very simple, is that a good structure is one, amongst many other things, where authority is, is matched with responsibility and is matched with rewards. So imagine that I have high responsibility, but no authority to get it done. I'm a salesman. I'm responsible for millions of dollars of sales, but I have no authority to sign any agreements, to give any discounts, to even quote prices, to drive the company car and visit the clients. No authority, but a lot, lots of responsibility and I get on a fixed salary. How long before I'm going to see, and, and by the way, 
And this part of a good structure is management information system. The structure should be transparent so we can see who's performing at what level. If you don't have those and nobody can tell that I'm not selling, how long I say, you know what? I can't do my job. I don't have the authority. I'm getting paid a fixed salary. I'm just going to retire on the job. It's called sitting on your hands. Now, management doesn't know what I'm doing. Everybody else, all my colleagues, they know I'm not doing anything. How long before they also say, why am I working so hard? It's happened, they all just got burnt. So a good organizational structure needs to align authority, responsibility, and rewards. Another situation, this is called the son of boss. By the way, I'm the son of boss, so I can tell this joke without, uh, you know, I, I have the right to. It. But uh, the son of boss scenario is, Lots of authority, low responsibility, lots of rewards. I have little to do, little responsibility. I get paid a lot and I have a lot of authority. This is not me, by the way, but that's certain cases. How does that affect the company culture? How does that affect the culture of mutual trust and respect? Again, you want those things aligned. Beyond that, I'm gonna go further into structure here because that's also a big piece of the Adesis methodology. You want to, we have a saying in America, which is good fences make good neighbors. If we don't have good fences, then I don't know where my backyard begins and your backyard ends, which means that your dog is always pooping on my lawn. What does this look like in an organization? What it looks like is I'm doing my job and suddenly you get out of your lane and you start getting into my lane. Because, hey, this is my job. This is my authority. Why are you jumping into my set system, making decisions on my, on my job? You see how that's bad for mutual trust and respect? Or if I'm a salesman and I go to visit one of my clients and I see your business card sitting on the reception desk because you just visited them. Why are you visiting my client? Bad for trust and respect. By the way, that's a good scenario. A worse scenario would be nobody does the job not my job, not my job, and things start falling through the cracks. That's even worse. So good fences make good neighbors. Beyond that, we will transparent fences. It's important for me to know not just what my responsibility is, but what your responsibility is. What's your deliverable? If I'm a salesman and I'm, I see you, other salesmen, taking the private jet to go visit clients and going to fancy restaurants and spending tens of thousands of dollars. Well, I don't even have authority. That's your authority. You see that? You have authority to take the private jet. I don't have authority to even fill up my car with gas to go visit my clients. I'm jealous of you. I resent you. But if there's transparency in your responsibility, in your deliverable, and I know your deliverable is $100 million in sales in the next quarter. Well, my deliverable is $100,000. You know what? I used to resent you. Now I'm kind of concerned about you because I don't know how you sleep at night. Your deliverable is so high, I don't know how you're gonna reach it. Me, 100,000, I can get there. You, good luck. You know what? I stop resenting you, I start feeling sorry for you. I start, if you need my help, let me know. It changes the culture. So transparent fences are also required. Okay, one last thing on structure. There's a lot here. We have manuals and manuals on how to structure an organization correctly, I'll give you one last piece, which is an important one, which is that it's important that the management drive the direction of the organization and not the structure. Management should drive the structure and not structure drive the management. Let me explain. Imagine that you have the title Vice President of Sales and Marketing, very common title. Recognize that sales has a short-term orientation. It's measured every month. What did you sell? Marketing has a long-term orientation. What new markets are we going after? How is our market changing its needs? Understanding our clients. This is much longer term. If you put them together under the same vice president, what are they going to focus on? The long-term or the short-term? The short-term, right? right? They're going to focus on sales. Mark become an afterthought. Marketing will start doing, you know, sales materials. 
little flyers that salesmen can hand out. That's not true marketing. Now imagine I'm the CEO and I'm telling all of our investors and all of the media and our board of directors that we're going for new markets and new directions. And I look at you and what are you doing? Sales. What am I going to do now? I'm going to start micromanaging you. Why aren't you doing this? Why aren't you doing that? And you can see how that hurts the culture of the organization. That's going to hurt mutual trust and respect because now the structure is driving the short-term, long-term orientation of client interface. That's the, the function. Or if you have vice president of production and R&D, production short-term, R&D long-term, you put them together, the structure is now determining the short-term, long-term orientation of that function. And you know, if you have a CEO or a founder or a president and they feel like they're losing control of their organization, that's gonna promote some really bad behavior that's gonna hurt mutual trust and respect. So make sure that the organization is structured in a way to make sure the right people have control. All right, let's move on. We have good ingredients, you and me. We're making an apple pie together. We have a great recipe that we're making the apple pie with together. And we have an oven that works fine. Only one problem, in your mind, you think we're making the apple pie for the Queen of England. In my mind, I think we're making the apple pie for McDonald's. When our apple pie comes out of the oven and falls on the ground, I'm going to pick it up, blow it off, stick it in a cardboard box and say, next customer, please. While you, you're going to have a big fight and you're saying, no, you know, gold plate, flowers, ice cream. We just start all over again. This has been on the ground. We're going to have a big fight because we have different mission and if you want to change an organizational culture, you know, it's, we have to work on all four of these holistically and in the right sequence. Notice how there's plenty of books written about how to change people. Most management books are on this subject. There's plenty of books about management process like Kaizen and, and Scrum. That's, that's a very few, in fact, sort of best in class process here. Very few people play with structure. And even fewer, I mean, there's pl plenty of people like Blue Ocean Strategy, a lot of Porter's Five Forces that exist here. I would say Adesis' biggest value is we have a best-in-class approach to structure and management process. But more importantly is we understand how to work on all four of them holistically and in the right sequence. Richard, I, I realize I went over on the time. Do we want to oh, take okay. questions now Good. or should we? Yeah. yeah, we'll take a couple of questions. A couple of questions. By the way, um, Shaham is in the island called Patan, is it? Three hours away from Bali. He must be um, having a good time in the island and he couldn't get back to Bali because Bali is locked down. <laughs> so he has presented from an island where internet services is not at its best. So there are some occasions where there's a lack. We, uh, we ask for your, your patience of your... Um, and the understanding. Uh, one question from Eric. Uh, people, uh, there are good and bad people, but good and bad people are not written on the face. That means they can't know, right? So at work, we need, we see if we need good people and bad people uh, to, to, uh, to become better, exactly read what is it, become better uh, work and rest. But bad people got their, his purpose or their purpose and we cannot fire him. You understand the question? Basically, he said that, hey, how do we know we can't see them in the face, good or bad? Why once they come in, they get into the system and then we cannot fire the, the bad people. <laughs> hey. Particularly in the Asian context, once you get in, it's tough to... Uh, the fire without without having a big compensation or whatever. Right? One thing you can do is, is quarantine them. Like I said, keep don't give them any managerial responsibility. Have them work like a subcontractor. That's one option. But just I think it's important to understand that some fish swim better in muddy water, while other fish swim better in clear water. 
Sometimes we look at an organization and the water is murky. This is the system. The structure is murky. It's called backroom dealing. All the decisions are made politically with whispers in the back room without transparency. And the people that look good are the people that are good at politics. When you clean the water, the people that looked like bad people might start performing better. So before you judge who's a good person, who's a bad person, it might be a good idea to first clean up the system, clean up the water. And you might see that who you thought was good, who was good with politics and backroom dealing, is now not performing well. And the people who couldn't deal with that and were acting out all of a sudden start performing much better. Now, obviously, if they're stealing from the company, if they're doing things that are, are hurting mutual trust and respect, that's a totally different story. Thank you. I hope uh, Eric answered the question. Next question is, what is the ideal scenario, scenario when the CEO realizes that the salesperson is only doing sales and not marketing as per job or expectation? Look, it, it depends on the size of your organization. If you have a small organization, de facto, the CEO founder typically does the marketing. So that person is just doing sales and typically the founder CEO is doing the marketing. But in a larger organization where you have the resources, what you should do is separate the sales function from the marketing function. They should be different functions under different vice presidents. One's looking at the short term, one's looking at the long term. And now... Uh, there will be conflict, but allow that conflict to come up to the top so now you can control the organization. You have the levers. And then when you set the budget for the organization, what is my budget for sales? What is my budget for marketing? That'll give you the opportunity to leverage what is my focus, short-term or long-term. Now you're in control. Thank you. Maybe we'll take one more question before you proceed. Apart from the CVs filtering, reference check, reference and background checks, is there anything else we can do to filter out the bad apples so that they won't contaminate the company's culture? That's a, that's a great question. I think that there's a whole discipline in that and a whole sort of interviewing technology. And um, you know, you're referring to here, like with all kinds of questionnaires and stuff like that, um, what I heard a lot was the, the simulations. When you're hiring someone, put them in a similar environment to the one that you think they're going to have to work in. I know some companies, when they're looking for someone to start a job, they hire two people and they have them both do the job. And then by seeing how they interact and how they work, that gives you a much better opportunity to evaluate the person than just by the CV and just through the interviews. Okay, thank you. There are a few more questions. We'll take that later on. Now you may proceed to the to your the other materials, um, Sean. Okay, so now what we'll talk about is how do we apply this in a remote working environment? So now we understand what beyond the actual office environment is affecting culture. So what else can we work on? Let's take a look at what's the difference between the normal and online world. One thing is that in the online world, you have more distractions, less opportunity for direct oversight. My couch is there, my TV is there, the fridge is there, and my family's there. Hard for me to focus on my work or harder than in a focused work environment. So less natural bumps. Bumps being where we bump into other workers, managers, uh, subordinates in the elevator, at the water cooler, at the coffee machine, at lunch, at the local restaurants. And this creates a bigger barrier for sharing of information, especially upward in the organization. They have less interaction with my boss's boss's boss, let's say. This is, there's less social glue, which requires more formal glue. And this is kind of hard to understand, so let me explain with an extreme example. The extreme example I'm gonna use is, is what we call the typical Mexican company. It might even be a typical Malaysian company. A typical Mexican, com Mexican company, the founder is the grandfather and all of their sons and daughters are working within the organization and even their sons and daughters, the founder's grandchildren are also working in the company. So 95% of the company 
has the same last name and spend Sunday together, together at the family barbecue. In this organization, if I'm one of the grandchildren and I just sold some product to our customer and I got a check or I got cash, there's no real need for a system to make sure I took the money and put it in the bank. Why? Because if I steal from the company, I'm stealing from my own family, which means I'm stealing from myself. That's the social glue in an extreme scenario. The more friendliness, the more camaraderie you have within the organization, the less there is a need for systems and rules. Because we, we know what we're doing. We don't need all these rules and people telling us what to do. We're all sharing a common goal. We're all working together. Your win is my win. But as the organization falls apart, they start hiring more people or the family has a fight. One of the grandchildren decides to marry a girl from the wrong side of the tracks, whatever it is. Now, if we don't have these systems and rules, well, the whole company can fall apart. It's a different kind of glue. The rule system driven glue. Now, just if you know Adesis in our language, we call the social glue integration. That's the I energy of management. While the formal glue, the system driven glue, is the A energy of management, administration, we call it. The more social glue you have, the less administration you need, and vice versa. Now, don't go to the extremes. If you have no social glue and everything is rule, rule driven, system driven glue, that's called a bureaucracy. And the opposite is true. If you only have that social glue with no systems, your organization is very fragile because at any point in time, they can have a fight, one wrong word, and that social glue can disappear very quickly. We want to have the right balance, but keep in mind that as the social glue reduces, because we don't have opportunities to hang out with each other, to talk around the water cooler, to share experiences, to become friends with each other, to hang out socially, we have to make sure that we increase that system-driven glue. Also, less opportunities for top managers to naturally transfer the purpose, the culture, the mission through their personal interactions and by leading through example. So Steve Jobs, in some of his interviews, he talked about how he saw his role as being the, you know, the carrier of the flag, which is the vision and direction of the organization. The people working in the field, they get lost in the weeds, in the trees, in the forest. His job was to constantly reiterate where are we going? What's the long-term goal? And he did it through all of his interactions, formal, informal, and that's what he saw his job as. When you're working online, you have less opportunities to transfer that example. You know, what is the, vi the vision, mission, and values of the organization? So let's see how this applies to people. Well, talking about hiring people, we, if we're working online, we want self-starters who are capable of independent action, don't need a people around them, an audience, people to talk to. They have to work from home. And obviously they should command and grant mutual trust and respect. But let's face it, unless you're hiring people, you're really stuck with the people you have. And hiring new people is gonna be very expensive and training them. You don't switch over your people just because you're working online. But if you're hiring new people, you can look for people that fit the online working, you know, good for online working environments. Okay, for people we recommend, or this is, you know, from what I've read and what I've studied in preparation for this course, encourage dedicated home working environments to reduce distractions. In fact, some of our clients, they even gave money to, to their workers to buy desks, chairs, monitors, you know, here's some money, make sure you have a dedicated working environment, you know, a good speaker system, upgrade your internet, as Richard was talking about with my, I apologize for the poor internet here. Also have them work standard hours. If you have people working on call or there's no standard hours, then they're on call. And what happens is they start mixing their home life with their work life. If I'm on call all the time, it means that I'm always working which means that I might start mixing what is my home life and my work life, and I might start only being available when I'm needed and not actually spending the time I need on work. When there's a distraction, I can allow that distraction to take me away from my work. 
we suggest that you have set working hours when people are on. And outside of those hours, let them be off. Tell them to get offline, off of their WhatsApp. We can make up for the natural bumps or lack of natural bumps with virtual working rooms. That could be as easy as opening up a Zoom between your working group. And this doesn't have to be the entire working hours, but for two hours a day, perhaps, we just sit around and we work on our stuff while we're sharing a space so we can talk and we could share information. I just have that room open. If that doesn't work for you, um, you know, just having a WhatsApp chat between working groups, that could also work or an open chat online. We can, I've also heard of organizations doing happy hours online or small outdoor informal gatherings like a walk in the park. If your quarantine allows that, you have a top manager anchor the event by just saying, I'm gonna go for a walk in the park at these hours. If you wanna join me, please let me know. We'll limit it to five people. And this kind of will give them an opportunity to A, get out of the house and get some exercise and also interact with the top managers in, in a more informal way. And that way you can kind of share that mission vision. And obviously one-on-one -on -one informal online conversations between top managers and workers to make the get up and walk around approach to management. I'm not sure if you've heard of that get up and walk around approach, but that's an actual sort of methodology and there's been books written on that. So just, you know, it's an approach to management. Get up on your desk, walk around, meet people. Let's go to the management process. Definitely have a meeting routine. Meetings should happen on a regular rhythm, the same time every week. And they should happen often. The key to having meetings often is to keep them short. These are called stand-up meetings in Scrum. They're 15 minutes long. And you can even have them in working groups in the morning and at the end of the day. If you keep them short, it's not that big of a deal. In the morning, what are you going to do today? At the end of the day, what have you done today? And have people report. Now, there's obviously the meetings should have clear goals. And what we like to do is differentiate between team building, informal, problem identification, problem solving meetings. These are dealing with complex problems for which the task is not clear. What should we do about it? We don't know. There's a pain point. We have to dissect it. We have to better understand it. We have to share information. That's one kind of meeting. Another kind of meeting is your command and control meetings. These ones are not informal. These are more formal. What did you do? What are you going to do? So there's a different culture in these different meetings. For the team building problem solving meeting, if you disagree with me, your manager, you should speak up and share your information. In a command and control meeting, you should shut up if you disagree with me and just do your job. Totally different cultures between these different meetings. If you don't differentiate the two, people get confused. They might withhold information because they think it's the, the other kind of meeting. Or they might disagree with you when you're giving them objectives and things to do, and that could undermine your authority. We have to be clear, what kind of meeting are we having? Is it a meeting where the tasks are clear and I'm telling you what to do? Or is it a meeting where we're trying to solve a problem and we're trying to share information and I want you to speak up and not shut up? Both should take place often. Obviously, command and control meetings take place more often, short and fast, while these team building informal meetings actually take place, they're actually longer. One of the things that we do in Adesis is we use these informal team problem solving, problem solving meetings to build teamwork. The best way to build teamwork is by getting different individuals to work together to overcome an obstacle that no individual can overcome on their own. That's what you do in an outdoor exercise. When they take your management team to the mountains and give them a wall they have to climb over that's too tall for them and they have to work together. They build teamwork. But what they're doing in these outdoor exercises or these ropes courses, as they're called in America, I'm not sure if you have them in Malaysia. Do you guys have them, Richard? No. Sorry. I was just writing something, yeah. Do you have those outdoor exercises, ropes courses? Are they popular in Malaysia? Rope courses? 
these are like where we management team out yeah. to the mountain. Yeah, all yeah, kinds yeah. of physical obstacles. Quite, quite popular, yeah. Weekends, management retreat, you know, retreat very often, yeah. I mean, that a lot, uh, Most, lots. They're very powerful in the short term because by working together to overcome these obstacles, you build teamwork, you build mutual trust and respect. Problem is, is that we're taking you out of your environment, the work environment. And of course, your behavior changes. But what happens Monday morning when you go back to the old environment? Your behavior goes back. So why should we be looking for problems? Why should we look for problems outside of the organization, challenges outside? We have plenty of challenges within the organization that no individual can overcome on their own. These challenges are called problems. And one of the problems or one of the, the things we recommend you start with is processes that are not defined. I'm not talking about management processes. I'm talking about new product development process or development of marketing material process or the sales tracking process, the accounts receivables, you know, accounts payables process. All these different processes, which used to not require a defined process because they did organically through those social interactions. Now there might need to be a, a, a need to increase that rule-driven, system-driven interactions, uh, processes, you know, th that glue. One way to develop that glue is to use defining processes as a team-building exercise. And by working together to redefine that process with the people involved with that process, it's kind of like a ropes course. We're overcoming an obstacle that no individual can overcome on their own. Again, we use the solving of problems as the team building exercise. We can also leverage the many project management applications like uh, there's many like Monday is one, and there's many others and uh, use shared docs for information sharing. There's a lot of software out there that's part of this management process for info sharing. I'll move on here, structure. Make sure the structure is clear and functional. Make sure that there are clear short-term goals and deliverables. This is true for online and offline, but even more so for online because you don't know if your people are working. You don't know if they're at their desk. And one thing you can do is use some kind of software to track their hours and track their computer clicks and see what they're working on. That's measuring throughput. Better to measure output. Are they delivering? If they're delivering, you can leave them alone and let them work from home however they want and not start getting paranoid that they're just taking money and not doing anything. Create transparency in those deliverables so you feel comfortable in the output and what they're delivering. Also, make sure there are clear lines of authority because if I'm working in the office and I have a problem, it hurts. I have to tell somebody it's pain on me and I have to solve it. I'm driven to deal with it more than if I'm working at home. I'm out of that environment. And it's much easier for me to check out and say, okay, that's the problem. It's not my problem. I don't want to deal with it. And I bury it. If I don't know who to go talk to, if I don't have those clear lines of authority and a clear way of communicating my problems, going to the right people, I don't know who that right person is, I'll be more likely to bury the problem. And again, a problem unaddressed is a crisis in waiting, and that's going to kill mutual trust and respect. Finally, mission, vision, and values. Make sure people understand the why. Don't let them get lost. You have to constantly reiterate this. One thing that we've seen people do, companies do, is bring the clients to the workers. Not literally, but figuratively. I'll give you an example that was quite successful. We were working with a company that built medical devices that were being used with children with cancer. And they had a quality control problem on the manufacturing floor. So what they decided to do amongst many other things, defining processes and all kinds of other pro things they, they, they implemented was get a picture of a child with cancer using the machine, various children and putting it in different places along the production line. So people would see who was the end user and why they were building these machines. That's called bringing the clients to the workers. 
We've also seen virtual town halls where top managers sort of sit there online, kind of like this, and all the workers show up and ask them questions. And this is an opportunity for them to reiterate and communicate the mission, vision, and values of the organization. Another thing that we've seen, which is good, which is we can find ways to set examples, like through award ceremonies, online award ceremonies, giving people for their embodiment of the mission, vision, and values of the organization. So those are really different tools within this, this framework to help you craft your culture, or cultivate the right culture in your organization, even if online. Just remember that in order to change an organization's culture, it's not enough to just work on one of these factors. In fact, when you're eating an apple pie, it's very unclear if the apple pie, if that pie doesn't taste good, if it's bad. You don't know if it's bad apples or a bad recipe or a bad oven or a bad purpose for which they made the apple pie. It just tastes bad. All of these are highly intertwined. They affect each other. So if you just work on one of them, it's not as effective as working on them holistically and in the right sequence. That's the key. So what have we talked about today is just that we need a culture of mutual trust and respect. It's a key component for organizational success. And there's been a lot of emphasis placed on the working environment, a lot of money spent on making sure that we have the right offices. What we're saying is that not only now with working remotely, but even in normal times, there's more to culture than just your office. So we can focus on these other factors, which is the people and the system in which they work in, the mission, vision, and values, and the managerial process. Things you can't touch, but are just as important as the people you hire. And you can use those to craft your organizational culture. And we, then we talked about how to do that specifically in an online working environment, how it applies there. So that's my presentation and I'm ready now for questions. Good, thank you. Okay, just when you talk about the mission, mission and values, one question is how do you constantly instill the company's mission, vision and values when there's a lot of a high turnover, for example, Amazon has a high turnover of, it's, it's being reported at over 100%, and yet lot of, lots of people want to join Amazon. <laughs> it's a great question. And um, I, I almost refer back to the video you showed at the beginning of, the tr of this event. That short video was a great way to instill and communicate what are the values, what is the purpose of Vistage? Um, one of our clients, and I would you know, love to plug this because they made a video that was largely about Adesis because Adesis, this culture of mutual trust and respect, that's their operating system. And they made a video and they paid for it. And it was kind of a big half an hour commercial for Adesis. And they even hired my brother, who's a movie maker, to make the video. So they really you know, came to us. And one day when we were having dinner, I asked the guy respectfully, says, you know, that's, I thank you so much for making this video. It's helped us get a lot of clients, but why did you do it? You know, because it cost them like, I don't know, $20,000. And he says, simple. We did it first of all, as a thank you to Adesis, but we also did it as a way that any new person coming to our company, they watch this video, they understand our purpose, they understand our values, they understand our mission, they understand how we operate, it's an indoctrination, it's an onboarding video. So that could be an easier way if you have high turnover to sort of instill that. Thank you. Uh, relating to the MTR, one question is, yeah, if you implement the MTR, um, it may be exploited. I don't know, they may understand it. Maybe exploited. Uh, be appeared that you had respect and so on, and exploited and may not build the culture that you wanted. But your great, comment. Question. great question. You're absolutely right. If you come in and inject mutual trust and respect, if that's what you're putting in the organization, it will get exploited. It's, it's very dangerous. And that's what many coaches do. They coach you to be, start being more trusting, start being nicer, communicate nicer. Like, they go through the people angle. If you try and make people more trusting and respecting, you're injecting, you're trying to inject mutual trust and respect. 
You can't inject mutual respect. It's not an input, it's an output. How do you create culture of mutual trust and respect? You do it through the, the right managerial process, creating the right environment where people can listen to each other and they learn from each other and they do what they say they're gonna do. That's how you create mutual trust and respect. I respect you because what you say makes sense to me. I learned something from you. And I trust you because what you said you're gonna do, you did. And in order to make that managerial process work, we need a clear structure. We also need a common mission, vision, and values. They're all intertwined. But for me, it starts with this managerial process. And now what we're touching on, if I could talk further, because there's a chicken and an egg problem here. I'm not sure if you caught it. In order to solve, the way that we create mutual trust and respect is by solving problems together. By solving problems is I'm listening to you on how to solve the problem. I'm seeing your point of view and I'm learning from you. And when it comes time to implement, I'm doing what I said I'm going to do, which makes you trust me. But in order to solve problems, what do we need? We need mutual trust and respect. But the way we create trust and respect is by solving problems. You see the chicken and the egg here? Do you guys see that? How do we solve it? In order to understand how we solve that chicken and the egg problem, it's important to understand that mutual trust and respect is relative. For example, if I'm talking with you about the weather, about the Olympic games, we don't need much trust and respect because it's a low conflict subject we're discussing. Now let's elevate it to religion and politics. What happens there? Suddenly we're reached a higher level of conflict and the same level of trust and respect is no longer enough to match our higher level of conflict. We start having a fight. So there's the correct sequence in solving problems. People want to start with the root cause, which is people. That guy's the problem, fire them, fire them. That is the highest level conflict. They want to start with structure. He's in the wrong job, she's in the wrong job, switch positions, high level conflict. What you want to do is don't start here. Start here with the small, the managerial, pro, sorry, the operational processes to find them. That's a low conflict item. By working together, what happens to mutual trust and respect? It goes up a little bit, allowing you to work on a higher level problem. By solving that, more trust and respect, and you build it like a wave. That's why the sequence is so important. So don't make mutual trust and respect your input. It's an output, an output of working together in the right managerial process with the right structure to back it up, along with the right mission and vision on the right problems in the right sequence, to build the mutual trust and respect as an output. So what you are saying that you need to have the vision, the mission, values, the proper structure, the management process right, and also recruitment proper. You have a, a process or SOP that ensure you recruit right. By observing and the discipline in this, it helps you towards building a mutual trust and respect and not the other way around, right? Right. <laughs> Yeah. Not, not by telling people, hey, let's all trust and respect each other. And you trust them and they trust you. And it's going to burn you very quickly because you're trying to inject it. And the moment somebody does something wrong, they're all going to say, aha, this doesn't work. And it's all a disaster. In our methodology, we say the words mutual trust and respect two times. At the very, when we introduce the subject and one more time at the, to, to sort of reinforce it. After that, don't say the word because we can't input it. Work on the problems in the right way, in a way that promotes mutual trust and respect, and the trust and respect will emerge on its own. Yeah. I, I just sharing, during the nine X days when we implement the RDC methodology to almost every level, and is there any problem solving uh, groups or meetings, we have these rules, right? By observing the rules, we are actually then giving mutual trust and respect, all right? The rules puncture for a meeting, and if you're not there, and you let the people know, and start on time, finish on time, all these are helping towards building this. Without all those, it's chaos, right? Now, reading to this, somebody said, just gee, the MTR is very, very key too. If I build, I have the reason why we're in business, it means the mission, vision, the value, you got the right structure and so on. Can we measure mutual trust and respect using a metrics? 
you can't, okay, let me tell you, there's a soft way to measure it and a much more robust way, like a hard science way. And the hard science way, you can't really measure mutual trust and respect. All you can measure is how it changes over time with a questionnaire. You know, the questions you think you would, you would ask, you know, um, can, can I depend on my uh, colleagues to do this? Can I, do I trust and respect my colleagues? There's, we have a questionnaire you can, okay. Okay. you can work, but then it's only a starting point. You have to check it again a year later. Yeah. And this is kind of the hard science. There's another way to do it, which is softer, which is what I talked about earlier. Raise the level of conflict. See at what point hear cracks in their voices. Turn up the heat. At a certain point, you're going to start pe seeing people act out. What point that is, it's like a truck. How much weight, how much conflict can the organization carry? Is it a one-ton or a two-ton truck? So that's what we do with organizations. We have a process to slowly turn up the heat within a safe environment, with control systems, with a pressure release valve, so if it doesn't blow up, but start seeing where the cracks start to form. Yeah. So what you're saying, yeah, you, you do, this is do have a set of questions, but measuring the, um, the improvement of deterioration over a period, almost like doing a culture survey of the Gallup poll, right? Then you have to do, you cannot just measure once and say you're there and then you have to measure uh, periodically to see where, where it is uh, improving and not improving. Uh, how do you draw the line between coexisting of having authority and having mutual trust and respect in an organization. Okay. Exactly right. Yeah, I think I know this. I think I understand the question. Let me explain it, and maybe the person who asked it can can tell me if I got it right. Mm. Um, I, th I think that what's inherent here is that there's really two different management paradigms that need to coexist at the same time. The first one is this management paradigm. This management paradigm is I'm the boss, you're the worker, you need to do what I tell you to do because I'm the one respond have authority here and just do it. This is called dictatorship. And this is not good at building mutual trust and respect, but it is good at getting things done. Hmm. The other management paradigm is this one right here. This one, my job is not as a manager is not to tell you what to do. My job is to get all of you who are different to work together to solve your own problems. It's a much more feminine approach to management. It's one that builds mutual trust and respect. This is good at getting things done, but it's bad at dealing with problems, complex problems. It's bad at creating change. It's like the military. There's a problem in the military. It doesn't go up the chain of command. It only goes down. So information doesn't come top, bottom up. This is good for bottom up communication, but it's bad for getting things done. This is, as I was talking about earlier, your team building, problem solving meeting, where if you disagree with me, please speak up. While this is your command and control, if you disagree with me, shut up and do your job. You see the difference? This and this are both needed for good management. If you just do this, in the short run, you'll get a lot of things done, but you're gonna kill your culture. And also, you're not going to be adapting to change. If you just do this, You'll have a great culture in the short run, but over time, nobody's going to be held accountable for anything. And nothing is going to get done. What we need is both of them. But in order to have both of them, I need to both have you shut up and speak up at the same time. How do you bridge this gap that we call democracy, dictatorship and democracy? We need them both. We need democracy. And that's part of our managerial process, part of our structure. It's embedded in the methodology. So we actually have a complementary organizational structure. Thank you, Amy. Yep, good. Um, yeah, one question relating to that is, how do, we, how do you deal with the high performing manager, excellent in delivering results, but bad attitude? Okay, I, I would refer you back to that whole clean water, fish that swim well in clean water versus fish that swim well in dirty water. Maybe they have a bad attitude because of the environment. So I wouldn't write them off yet. First, you clean the aquarium, clean the system, and then see how the people behave before you sort of write them off. Now, if you do have somebody that is genuinely just poor behavior, 
and they're very difficult to work with. There is coaching, right? There is sort of all kinds of, there's so many products out there and services to help people sort of open their heart and become better managers in that point of view. That's one thing you can consider doing if they're critical for your organization and if they're a manager. Another thing that you can do is you can quarantine them. What does that mean? Take them out of a management position within the organization. You have a different manager and they become an area expert. So this guy's managing and when they need expertise on anything, they can go to this guy who has the experience, who has the company knowledge and they're still part of the organization in a very good title. Don't, don't diminish them because that will hurt their, you know, their self-esteem, their, their position. We want to continue having them in high position and reduce their managerial oversight. They become an expert. Thank you. So relating to that, I see one question. How do you handle being, I mean, the senior manager, how do you handle insubordination? <laughs> Boy, how do you handle insubordination? Let me I mean, start if, yeah, okay. <laughs> probably need more information on that, but you know, one thing is, if we don't differentiate between this environment and this environment, mm. then people get confused and they have a problem and they don't know where to air that problem and they don't have this forum to air the problem. So they end up airing it in this environment and that's insubordination. In this environment, it's not insubordination, it's helping out the team. So they might think, you know, be, be careful of those people because they might be the canary in the coal mine. The one person that's actually telling you what's really happening. If you just have this, you might end up with what's called malicious obedience. That's mm. a term coined by one of our clients that was in a big bureaucracy, which means that people do what they're told to do, even though they know that it's bad for the company. And they implement it in full faith just to say, see, I did it and screw you, manager. Now you got to live with the problem. We mm. want to avoid that. So make sure you have that forum for them to speak up in a constructive way so it gets channeled in the right direction. Now, if they're seriously diff difficult, I mean, if, you know, obviously if it's, a, if it's a disaster situation, you might have to make an example of them, right? But look, there's a whole other lecture here about power, authority, and influence. If you use your authority too much, you diminish it. The more you use your authority, the less powerful it becomes. The more you use your power, the less, pow the less powerful it is, the less effect it has. The more you use influence, the more powerful it becomes. If you're using only authority and power, that's dangerous. In the short run, it gets things done. If it's a crisis, you have to use authority and power. But if you have time by working through a process, so that way you can get your workers to understand the reasoning, they can understand why it's the best idea, they can understand why you're not taking their idea, and they understand the, why, the reasoning behind it, then your influence will grow over time. And that's why we recommend that if all things being equal, if you have time, use more influence than authority or power. In your, in your opinion, is there a culture gap between the Western and the Asian style of management or in the Western country or Asian country? It's a culture. You, in, the, in the States, the United States, I can't speak for all Western countries. I think it's relevant though, mm. is because we were taught this democracy thing from a young age and everybody's voice counts and everybody gets to speak up and freedom of speech, that when you get to an organization, people are really not afraid of their managers. They're mm. not afraid to tell their managers, you're wrong, I don't agree with you. There's that insubordination or that speaking out is very common. So, um, and, and there's not the same kind of like a hierarchy system. It doesn't matter who you are, even how much money you have. We're all equal in the American mentality, which creates an environment where while they're doing this, this creeps up a lot on its own. They don't have to, like in Russia, this, it's all this and there's none of this. So we really have to build this. In some American companies, it's all this and we have to build this. It's all about balancing the two. Do you see that? I think in, in Asia, I see a lot more of this because of the power distance between the CEO, top management, and the workers, which doesn't exist so much in the United States.
Did I lose you guys? Richard? <laughs> okay, good. Okay, so relating to Jackass 1915, um, let me see, I'm back, I'm stable. Okay, relating to that, much of the changes in organization culture begins at the top. This is uh, somebody saying, right? As they set the tone from the top is critical. How do you address the culture in boards, particularly in Asia where you have political appointees or in Asia on the board? <laughs> great, great comment. And the board has to be managed. And it's not just the board, it's every layer of management because you don't always have the buy-in. Some, some a vice president wants to change their culture. They understand the need for mutual trust and respect and their boss thinks it's a bunch of, you know, feel good BS. So now how do you deal with the level above? Mm. And what we, we have a concept is called CAPI. CAPI stands for Coalesced Authority, Power, and Influence. Sort of, you know, Aristotle, I believe, said, give me a place to stand and I can move the world. CAPI is your place to stand. If you don't have CAPI, you can't solve the problems. Mm. It's, if you try and solve problems for which you don't have the CAPI, you're wasting your time. It's an academic exercise. It's just a simulation. And everybody wants to work on those biggest problems, the ones they don't have CAPI over, which is wrong because you end up spinning your wheels and nothing kills mutual trust and respect more than working on a problem, solving it, thinking of a great solution, and then nothing happens. We wasted our time. Thank you. We have to focus on what we have CAPI over, even if it's a small problem. But what happens is, is realize authority is dynamic. It changes. An example of that would be Obama, Barack Obama, he had many enemies in the United States with the Republicans, and Fox News was always talking bad about him. But when he killed Osama bin Laden, he was untouchable for about 10 days. 10 days, nobody said anything bad about Barack Obama. Why? Because he was a winner. Even if you win small things, when you're able to make small changes, what happens to your perceived authority? What happens to your perceived power? And more important than all that, it's the C that coalesce. Coalesce is your ability to bring people to the table. If you're a loser and you have a bunch of meetings that go nowhere, the next time you call a meeting, everybody's busy. They won't come to your meeting. They have other things they have to do. You can't bring them to the table. But if you've made changes, if you're a winner, if you can solve small problems, your ability to call higher level authority to the meeting to solve the next level problem is increased. So you have to work on those, what you have CAPI over, even if it's small, even if it's just defining the, man, the, the process of new product development, of developing marketing materials. By solving that together, constructively getting through the conflict, moving the needle, what happens to your mutual trust and respect, and as a result, your ability to bring people to the table, your perceived authority, power, and influence. Hope that makes sense. In other words, build your cappy. Did we lose Richard again or am I lost? Sure, I think we lost Richard and uh, let's move on to the next question. Okay, did you wanna ask it? I don't have it in front of uh, me. You, do you, can you okay. see the resources? Oh. Okay. Richard. Where would you start first? You heard me? And said if you have limited time or limited budget to overhaul the culture of the company, where should you start first based on your, your, your four factors and which factor would you, in priority? <laughs> right. Well, Richard, can I, can I give a quick commercial and say I would start by attending the, uh, the Adesis, web, the Adesis uh, course taking place in Malaysia next month? Later on, yeah. <laughs> that's okay. just a commercial. You know, I would start by attending my course. That's a, that's a joke, obviously. Okay, yeah. <laughs> I, I think the, the place that we start is with the managerial process. Mm. What we do is, again, it's about the muscles. We start with a management. This is asking what is the right sequence. And I'm going to give you a very high level of what the right sequence is. Mm. We start by introducing our, quote, unquote, best-in-class managerial process that is commensurate with the complexity and the level of conflict within the organization 
You have to figure out how complex your organization is and then tailor this management process to fit that. And then once they start using this management process, it's like going to the gym. In this analogy, you want to get in shape, which means you want a culture of mutual trust and respect. And muscle, your muscle is that culture. And the muscle allows you to lift the weight, which is the conflict. Mutual trust and respect is like a muscle. You have to build it. Now, you don't start by, by working on the highest level conflict, which is structure. And mission, vision, and values is not a very high level conflict. It's just dreaming, which is important. As long as you wake up, it's important. But without the structure to implement the mission and vision, it's just words on paper. And we've had too many strategy meetings that go nowhere because we don't have the muscle to change the structure. So you start by introducing a management process and working on the lower level problems, the easier problems, which are late delivery times of our products, unclear manufacturing process, uh, you know, poor quality raw materials, uh, paying too much for, you know, these are all operational issues. Why do we have those issues? There's a cause, which is the structure, the mission, vision, and values. But we're not going to work on those causes. We're going to work in our CAPI to solve the operational problems, which require less people, lower level of authority. And we start moving the needle and people see that things are starting to change. We're, we start developing trust and respect in ourselves that we're able to start making things happen, which is building the muscle. Once you have enough muscle and you feel the energy start to release because you're becoming more efficient as an organization, then we use that management process to collaboratively, again, this management process is collaborative to solve complex problems, the thumb. It, it's, it's both the thumb and the index finger, but you probably already have the index finger. We have to build the thumb function. We use that same thumb function to get the top management team and key players from the long-term marketing, R&D, you know, uh, finance, get them to, and the top managers to jointly create the mission and vision and values of the organization. Where are we going? Now that we know where we're going, we can structure the organization to get there. You know, we, if we're going to Las Vegas, we're going to have a different car required than if we're going to Hawaii. Then we need a boat. So we have to know where we're going so we can create the organization to take us there. Once we get the right structure, then you build the management information system to make that structure transparent. And then you can work on reward systems. And once you've done all that, the whole time, because you're using our process, the people are also changing because again, you're using this management process as a team building exercise. By working on all these problems, you're building trust and respect, which is changing the people and solving problems at the same time. Once you're done with all that, what do you do? You start at the beginning. Just, just I didn't, the beginning of the management process is what we call a syndac. It's a synergistic diagnosis. The first step is coming to terms with where we are, which means getting all the problems on the table. It's a painful exercise. That was that pressure cooker where we turn up the heat and see how much mutual trust and respect is in the room. We get the management team, 25, 30 of them into a room. Richard can talk about his experience. I'm sure he's been through it multiple times. And we, have, we go through an exercise where we create the environment where we can talk about our potential improvement points, PIPs, another word for problem or opportunity. And now we put them all on the table and come up with a clear common plan of action, which I just gave you the outline of, starting with the operational problems, then we go to mission and vision, then we go to structure, and we sequence all of the collected problems in the right sequence, and everybody's aligned on it. And now we can move forward. You can't move forward in solving a problem until you give everybody a chance to put all their problems on the table. It's like poison in their blood. You have to get the poison out of the blood before you can move forward. I'll give you a quick example of what you might've seen is that you're in a meeting and you're coming very close to a solution to a problem. And all of a sudden somebody says, you know what, we're trying to solve the wrong problem. We should be solving that problem. And what about that problem? This is a sign that you didn't do the first step correctly. Because as we come to a solution to a problem, all of the conflict comes up. And that conflict might not be my best self-interest. I don't like the direction we're going. The easiest way to get us off the topic is to say, what about that problem? Now I've taken the 
entire meeting off the track. So the first step is actually what we call a syndag, which is a putting all the problems on the table and aligning on the sequence with which to solve the problems. And now we can move forward. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. I think we have to 12 o'clock already. What we want to do is do a close on this. And uh, after that, so the people who wants to go off will go off. And, uh, and then if those want to stay on and questions, we'll have another 10, 15 minutes. Um, could we have the slides on the... Yes. If you put on this. You know, our DCs has been, we have been, you know, I've been using for, for many years. I find very good. That's why even Vistage have brought the idea and uh, there are a few here cook soon and um, it's also familiar. And we used to introduce this concept. We have been bringing our deceased people uh, periodically um, to our summit or to our, uh, our talk those days when, uh, when things were not easily or we are not used to doing virtually. And, and there have been a lot of requests. And uh, with Shaham coming to Asia or in Indonesia, we have said, hey, why don't we do some regular workshops? And we don't have to fly all the way here and you take days. And hence, this was uh, proposed. We actually started in the middle of year and uh, in front last year and then into this year. And this is a workshop, how do we implement change effectively, essentially covering what Sharma has shared. And it's over three days, all right? And uh, you'll be helped in person. Uh, maybe, John, you can just a few minutes, what does it cover? Great, yeah, I mean, look, on the first day, we'll cover some of the basics, which is just defining what is management and why do we need management? That'll be just like, you know, very quick. And then we'll talk about what are the just to good management, which are the steps of the conflict we talked about. One of them being the conflict between speak up, speak up and shut up. It's conflict of democracy. Another one being the conflict of interest. Another one being the conflict of, we have different opinions because we have different strengths. You know, different cultures and there's actually seven different sources of conflict we'll be talking about going deeper into each one of them like management styles understanding how people are different going into each one of them and then once we understand that we'll talk a bit more about mutual trust and respect it'll be very quick just more examples and a sort of deeper dive into why that predicts success and then we'll go into that people what we should do about it which is the people process structure mission and vision which you just went over but we'll go much deeper into the managerial process. And that'll be sort of like day two and three, which will be, and also how to do structure correctly. Specifically, when I'm talking about the managerial process, how to make those seven sources of conflict constructive, and then how to hold the line. What is the terrain? I already went over the first step, which is have to do an, a problem definition, get all the problems on the table. Because if you're trying to solve a different problem than I'm trying to solve, we're naturally going to come up with there's a sort of a sequence. We have to hold the what is that sequence, and obviously there's there's a, a whole thing about life cycles, understanding organizational life cycles and how they change their culture across that life cycle, and many other sort of tangents like that that we'll also go into. But it'll be highly user driven. There's a huge body of knowledge, much more than I can cover in three days, and I'll be asking you what are your expectations and what do you want to cover and sort of tailor it um, specifically the last day for your needs. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, those are interested in being in contact with our uh, message. Just, okay, next one. Before you go now, uh, please answer the pop-up questions upon leaving the webinar. Just two simple, easy questions. If you can do that for us, well, thank you very much. Once you have done that, if you uh, need to leave, you're going to leave that and, um, and and we're going to stay around for another 10 minutes in case somebody has a, a certain 
question that pop up in the head that need uh, need to ask. 